as um, a lot of your members, I mean, that ambition to hire great people and therefore to run a company that is virtuous enough to attract the great people must be a significant motivating factor. Uh, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's absolutely no doubt if you look at many companies, and I think we were discussing this last night, many companies understand if you want to recruit and retain the best, you have to have an image and ethical reputation that people want to join you for. Yeah. And hence, a lot of people got into CSR. The issue about CSR mm. is it mustn't be an adjunct. It must be part no, of your exactly. DNA. Yeah. That's what really makes the difference. And you can never... That's why I think this thing about your actions speak louder than your words. You know, actually, just doing anything for the sakes of PR, whatever it might be in the press winning prizes, your people, your employees, and your customers see through it straight away. So unless you do things that are substantive, yeah. that are making a difference, that are within your DNA and understood by your employees, you're not going to gain the sort of traction you're looking for to create a better business for yourself yeah. and for your employees. But yeah. by the way, I should just be really clear about one thing. I'm not, by the way, saying every CBI member agrees with what I'm saying. For sure. I mean, I'm, yeah. you know, there, but I can tell you there are a lot I of people... I can believe that. Yeah, I can believe that. There, there, there are a lot of people in talking together, as you just saying really, really trying to find how do we balance these pressures of the, in the dynamism of capitalism, the accountability of capitalism, the need to have well-paid employees, the fairness issue, the public opinion issue, the concern about this work could lead politically to steps that could yeah. be hugely damaging for everybody, including the yeah. poor. You know, so I, I think people are really conscious of this, is what I would yeah. emphasize. And Francis, do you, Most th people do, do you think... You, are you looking slightly sceptical? Are you... Yeah. Uh, no, I want... I just, slightly, excuse me. I mean, do, do you think, as somebody... Uh, who has a lot of members negotiating on the other side. I mean, do you think that there is, you know, a beginning of a shift in attitudes? I, d I think the intellectual case has been won, yeah. you see. Okay. Okay. And I, I, so I agree. That's and there are some real deep thinkers from all these different constituencies who yeah. are coming together. But, but, but you know, I think we need to be frank about this. It's not a critical We're, mass. Yeah. Well, well, more that we haven't, we haven't seen the beef, have we? Yeah. I mean, what, what we know is that in Britain and in many other countries, we now have this increasingly large, low-paid army, often mm. in jobs um, that are very valuable but underpaid, often women yes. uh, and black and ethnic minority more likely to be insecure and so on. And that that great big belly at the bottom is growing, uh, that the jobs in the middle are being hollowed out, so we're seeing very big structural changes. Now, some people will say that's all about new technology or about a new influx of uh, workers into the global labor market, but we've had that before. For me, those changes are always going to take place. Um, the question is, in whose interests are they developed? And that's where I keep coming back to this thing of, uh, fantastic, though I think it is that we do have thought leaders in the business community, that voluntary self-reform ain't yeah. going to happen in my yeah. book. It takes more than that. Yeah. And it takes a more honest discussion about the fact that there is this growing disparity, not just of wealth and income, <laughs> but power. Yeah. And I thought, actually, Mike, you made a very interesting comment uh, about you know, the risk for our democracy of that. This is something I was picking up in the ether in some of those discussions in Davos that deeply alarmed me. I mean, in some ways, it's, it's been played out through the discussion about Greece, you know, where you have the people saying they can't take any more of austerity, they need some help, they need to, um, thank you, negotiate um, some yeah. debt forgiveness, and you have the troika, um, which is holding on very firmly to the position that it's taken. Now, that's being played out on the European stage, and it seems to me that we are in a transition period, but we can't be complacent about which way this is no. going to go. And for me, that gives this discussion some urgency, yeah, uh, and that we need to, I think, as yeah. Justin said, you know, it can't just be words. We've got to start it's seeing some place. action now and demonstrating that there is a yeah. better way that and, we and, can uh, do it. And just to add to that, I mean, it's, you know, we don't have that, that in this country, and we can talk about the, the lack of payment, but I, I don't see any way that, that democracy and capitalism survives an environment where you have 40 50% youth unemployment yeah. for Turkey a period. It's just yeah. inconceivable. Yeah. And you'll end up either in, in 1933... Yeah. 
Exactly. Absolutely. Let, let, me, let me bring Clive in, and then I'm going to throw it open to you folks. So we've got about half an hour for questions. I'll take questions in, in, in rounds of three. But, um, and we've got you know, the traditional kind of roving mics. Thank you very much. Um, but Clive, go on. And that whole threat to democracy, I think, is the issue that we're all yeah. facing, which is why I'm, again, delighted that an all-party parliamentary group is beginning to grapple with this across the, and search for political consensus on it. I'm also delighted that um, Francis was able to spot anything in the ether in, in Davos with all the, uh, <laughs> the fumes from the private jets that were flying in the air, uh, whilst the global elite descended to share with us their, their wisdom, <laughs> their great concern and their heartfelt the angst the, about the, the needs of poor people. Yes. Um, but I that whole question, as we've talked about it, there's something here around us, the concept of a new social contract that's required. Yeah, there's a new relationship needed between capital and labour. And that relationship seems to have slipped badly. It's slipped into something which begins to sound more like servant and master. Even when we hear, and forgive me, Mike, I don't mean you. I've enjoyed every comment you've made tonight. But sometimes when I hear genuinely heartfelt expressions from business people in the business community, even then it can sometimes come across more like noblesse oblige than come across about the fact that there are two equally moral constituents that come together in this process that the Archbishop called creativity, and it's capital and labor. And it was John Stuart Mill who, in 1859, said that the private landowner, let's call that the proxy in the mid-1800s mm -hmm. for a, a business person, the private landowner and the welfare recipient both earn their return from the sweat of somebody else's brow. Yeah. There's no moral difference between them. Yeah. They're both earning or yeah. receiving income from the sweat of somebody else's brand. Yeah. And I think there's fruitful area for us to explore in thinking about what the relationship between capital, which is so abundant today, Absolutely. that's the huge difference in the year yeah. 2015 to just 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. When we talk about what happened in the mid-1970s in the United States when productivity began to stop feeding through to pay, or happened here in 2003, it's because there was just so much capital yeah. in a post-industrialized world. And that, and that capital is seeking a return, yeah. and it flies around the world and seeks to find a business segment it can apply itself to. And those returns on capital, those required returns on capital, may provide a, a, the beginnings of a new conversation. Yeah. I'm in the insurance business. In the insurance business, we write insurance business, sometimes for returns on capital as low as 8%, I just pick a number to give it to you, because we're relatively comfortable that what we're insuring is predictable. Sometimes as high as 12% because it's not very predictable. And we're taking a risk, and our capital requires a commensurate return. Mm. What happens to the 13th percent? Mm. Well, in a master-servant relationship, mm. I take it. Mm. It's just a sweep. Mm. In the 12 was my cost of labor. Mm. Why would I share any of that? Mm. Now, a new type of relationship between capital and labor might ask a question about that 13th percent. Yeah. Who does it belong to? Yeah. Who did it? Yeah. Where did it come from? Yeah. And the 14th percent and 15th percent progressively, surely, there's some progressive sharing back of something. Yeah. Now, up to 12, it's tough to make that argument. Yeah. There is a de minimis cost to attract the capital, and there's a de minimis cost. Capital has to pay people to come to work and sweat the capital. Yeah. But beyond the 12, just to choose my yeah. very boring pedestrian life of insurance. But, 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 but I think, I mean, that's, I mean, Xavier, your point about democratization, I love this phrase, democratization of the distribution of capital. Um, <laughs> There's a, there's a rather bigger scale of potential for that now, given you know, the point Clive makes about its abundance. If you, want popular, if you want capitalism to be popular, you need popular capitalism. And, and I think the one thing that we need to project, and this is probably not what one wants to hear if one is a parliamentarian or has national responsibility or unionist, that we now operate in a global environment. Mm. Why have financial assets grown so much Hence, privileges, privileging those who own them, equity owner, investors. It's because essentially going back to 1987 and the crash, central banks have been injective, injecting massive amounts of money. And this is continuing at an accelerating pace. Mm. There's enormous growth in monetary asset, yeah. chasing real assets. So if you're a real asset owner, without doing anything, you, the value of your equity portfolio or other assets has been growing. Now, what's happened to labor? Uh, let's also look at it in a global environment. 400 million destitute Chinese in the last 10 years now are able to eat 
perhaps buy a car, have an apartment. So labor is not competing at the national level or at the regional level. Labor is competing at the global level. And it's not just immigration. I mean, there's always been immigration. Countries, nations, languages are made of a collection of other countries and other languages and other people, and that's not going to change. But it's the fact that 5 billion people who were looking at 1 billion wealthy people consuming and enjoying good lives and sending their kids to good schools for the most are now competing and want the same. So it's not just China, it's also Brazil and, and, and other areas. I'll give you an interesting statistics. The last time Europe had three consecutive years of um, fast growing corporate profits, that was 2005, six and seven, where on average for Western Europe, corporate profits were rising at about 15% per annum. If you look at the blue chip sector, the companies listed on the FTSE 100, the DAX, the CAC in France and the MIB in Italy, the four largest economy. Their profits were rising at 15% per annum. That means a doubling, roughly, of corporate profits over five years. So a very prosperous environment. The net job creation performance of the blue chip sector of those listed companies across those three years was net negative 0.4%. And that's the truth, is in a globally competitive world, the best you can hope for large businesses that are competing ferociously on the basis of costs. Perhaps they should compete more on the basis of innovation, but there's nonetheless ferocious competition now across more than six billion people. At best, you're gonna be able to keep the stock of employment more or less what it is. So where are we going to get that new wealth, those new good paying jobs? And I know it often sounds like a side issue, I believe for once that the only solution, not one of the solution, the only solution to net additional employment creation. There's nothing wrong with being a large business. I mean, these businesses are still there. We need to nurture them. But the solution to creating new jobs that actually pay well, pricing power in business will never be dictated. I'm afraid that's probably not what some of you want to hear by regulation or laws because businesses can move. That's just the reality. But what pricing power that is dictated by is innovation. You innovate a new service, a new product, you have pricing power, you then can pay your employees well. You're also going to be looking for well-educated employees. And that competitive dynamics in the last 15 years, in my humble opinion, has changed radically. So how can we reconcile citizens with a capitalist economy if it's not too late? Maybe it is. I don't believe it is, but we need a global financial and political governance system, for sure, some sort of level playing field. But we also need to ensure that that new wealth creation, that innovation, has the proper and the appropriate type of capital so that individuals, even if they come from a very poor neighborhood, and there's an amazing wealth of innovative and entrepreneurial power and resource in poor neighborhood sinking states, which we do not leverage. This is millions of people in Europe. But we need to get these entrepreneurs a fiscally non-handicapped, you know, equities are overtaxed and overregulated. People don't even know they exist anymore. Look at the power of crowdfunding. How many new businesses for it? That's one set of innovation. Let's get these entrepreneurs, let's get yeah. these kids growing up in neighborhoods to consider that joining a gang is not the only way forward. Maybe they can create a business. It's been done by 65,000 of them in the UK in the last 25 Brilliant. years. Yeah, let, 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 let's see some hands. Uh, let me see where you all are. Marvellous, thank you very much. Um, can we just start there and then I'm going to weave my way randomly round. But Barbara, do you want to... Oh, no, I just want to come back on this. Yeah. I'm all for poor people at, uh, who do have entrepreneurial spirit to find a way to actually have the financial resource capital to come in to do that. But I think what you've, you've said is, hints at a, I mean, a much, much bigger problem, which is really what Francis was talking about, which is actually fundamentally the race to the bottom on labour. And that's what we see in developing countries, that actually labour is not valued and you can move your, your stuff around so that you get the worst case. And I don't know whether any sets of fiscal arguments can deal with that. That, that is actually ultimately a moral issue, I'm afraid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tell us your name and kick us off. Jeremy Anson, KPMG, and a member of the UK Commission for Employment and Skills. Um, great to see the alignment. I wonder if I could push us on the practicalities of productivity. 
Uh, we seem to say that fair jobs require productivity and innovation. Uh, Francis said that uh, creativity is not the exclusive realm of the boardroom, and I think productivity isn't either. Mm. And it's great to see alignment and vision here, but if it does take collective action to move productivity and innovation, yeah. uh, what are the practical things and maybe one magic wand and one practical next step from different panel members? Yeah, lovely. Okay, who else had their hand up over there? I'll take a punch here. Yeah, gentleman there. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Jeff Knott. I uh, uh, work with Lord Way. Um, the, most of the... Um, stress, uh, except uh, the last, uh, Xavier and uh, Clive, has been really a, a on living wage and wage levels, mm. which really just keeps people in survival mode. Mm. Um, and yet, really, what the rich have is assets. And those assets earn, uh, well, they uh, multiply, they uh, increase and provide income, uh, fallback, security, uh, everything. So uh, what campaign is there Mm. about trans transferring assets uh, to uh, workers, basically. Yeah. Correct. Uh, you know, I'm, th I'm thinking what, uh, in policy terms, how can you incent, for example, employee-owned companies yes, like John exactly. Lewis? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Example, yeah, know. great example. Okay, someone else had their hand up over there. Yeah, uh, sorry, do you, you want to just take this gentleman here while the mic is... Sorry, so you at the... F uh, uh, no, go on. Uh, uh, let, let me take this gentleman first, and then I'll come to you, sir. Go on. Oh, no, it's coming to you. It's, the floor's yours. <laughs> well, <coughs> my name's John Dawson, and I work for a Conservative MP, and uh, I'm qualified to give these standards of economics, so that's why I'm interested. Could you just put the mic now, a bit closer to your mouth? That'd be great. Can you hear me now? That's great. Yeah, smashing. Right. Thank you. Well, <laughs> Justin, in his speech, said a level, a level playing field does not exist. And that's what you said we need. And you're just all talking there like intellectuals. Because for the last hundred years, it doesn't matter who's been in power, whether it's been Labour, Tory, SNP, or a coalition government, we've always had a huge difference in the rich and the poor. And it's got worse <coughs> under Labour and, and, and you, the TUC leader. I just want to know... It's all right saying we need this, we need that, but in reality, what are you going to do about it? Because nobody's done anything about it, yeah. making the ordinary working man better. Yeah. I think David Cameron and George Osborne, their policies are working. At least they're raising the, uh, the tax thresholds for the ordinary working people. But really, the rich are getting richer, and don't sit there leading the the trade unions, and it doesn't matter whether you're Labour or Tory. And the four top jobs in the country, I mean, 41 years ago, I was told we're moving into a classless society, but the four <laughs> top jobs in the country, like Prime Minister, Archbishop of Canterbury, the Lord Mayor of London, or the Mayor of London, and the future King, they're all old Etonians. So don't tell me about <laughs> everybody's gone into being equal again. Yeah. The wealth in the country is in the hands Perfect. of fewer and fewer people. I've got, I've got, the, the, I've got, the, nub, I've got the nub of your point, practical action. Yeah, can I just take the lady there, second row there? Thank you. And then I'm going to come to you, sir. Yeah. Uh, Emma Osborne, I'm an investment manager. Um, I was wondering whether the, uh, the panel thought other countries were managing it better and still managing to have a vibrant economy uh, and with uh, the absence of natural resources. So, so cut out those that have had the advantage of natural resources, um, cut out those that don't have dynamic economies, who's doing it better than the UK? And have you got a view on that <coughs> question? Yes, it, uh, I, I, I think there isn't anywhere particularly. I think it's a, I think it's a very deep-seated, rooted yeah. issue. I think one of the problems we've got is that we've been a rich economy yeah. and the legacy of that lasts for a very long time mm. and that causes all the uh, lack of competitiveness in labor and we're basically sharing what the, the, leg the positive industrial and commercial legacy we've got mm. with the developing economies. Mm. But when you look around internationally, you're not convinced actually that there's another country with a better model at this stage? No, I'm not. No. Okay, great. Thank you very much. The gentleman behind you there. 
I'm going to come over there. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Oliver Van Heel, um, uh, and I lead a, um, an initiative by the Aldsgate Group called An Economy That Works. And cool. uh, it's an alliance of businesses, uh, uh, civil society organizations, including the TUC, and when I say businesses, I mean large corporates, who seek to redefine the fundamental purpose of the economy under the understanding that our current singular focus on GDP growth is neither going to deliver yeah. prosperity, competitiveness, or sustainability. Which leads to, to my question. A lot of the points that, that various panelists made today echo some of the things that, that we talk about in, in an economy that works, including um, uh, job creation, equality, well-being, long-termism, inclusivity. However, if we are to secure a good economy uh, for the foreseeable future, there's one critical aspect that I don't think has been addressed at all, and I don't think it's either been mm. addressed in Rock or Sand, uh, the, the excellent publication, although I base myself on, on the, the press uh, for that. Um, uh, from the Church of England. Um, the book is even better. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the thing that's not being addressed here is the environment. Um, we yeah. cannot have a healthy economy if we do not protect the environment. And by that yeah. I mean a low carbon economy, an economy that strips out waste, an economy that protects the natural environment and biodiversity. Yeah, perfect. Can I take the lady at the back, right at the back, over there, and then I'm going to come forward. Yeah. Hello, I'm Trudy Elliott. I'm the Chief Executive of the Royal Town Planning Institute. Um, the Archbishop, when he spoke, talked about one of the four elements of uh, an economy based on solidarity as being... Mike, a bit close to you. Sorry. One of the four elements of the, an economy based on solidarity was good and affordable homes. Mm. And can I urge that we talk about this discussion about wages in the economy also at the same time as where people are going to live yeah. and whether we've got affordable, good homes? Because the number of children in this country living yeah. in poor accommodation is uh, growing... We failed for the last 30 years to build enough homes, and the number of people who have insecure tenure, i.e. less people are owning their home, less people have secure tenure, is increasing at the same time as wages are being squeezed. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, if you just take the gentleman with the glasses there, and then the gentleman uh, there. I'm James Cameron. I'm uh, chairman of the Overseas Development Institute, the ODI. And I founded a business a few years ago called Climate Change Capital, whose strap line was creating wealth worth having. So I, I'm, I want to do two things. I want to thank you very much. It's a good for, strap line. Yeah, it's not bad, is it? <laughs> um, I want to thank you very much for, I think it's a highly significant speech. And much of the commentary here is first class and, and genuinely uplifting. But I want to attach it to a request. We're entering election time. Mm. Sorry um, about that. Our, <laughs> our public debates are not nearly as engaged with these issues as they should be. <clears throat> Each of you have significant resources as individuals or companies or institutions. There's communications power on the panel there. Please make this a public debate. Please put this into this election. I'm absolutely convinced that it will engage people of all ages who don't really care very much about politics normally, who perhaps don't even vote, sadly, uh, who, who will know this matters. And all of the elements of the speech matter, including the environment one we just mentioned. All of them matter. They're interesting. Uh, people care about them passionately. They will engage people of all types. But we don't have it in our current discourse. It's not nearly evident enough in the way we conduct contemporary politics. So that's just my request. It's a thank you, but a big request. Use what powers you have to make this a debate that we can all participate in. Thank you very much. And then the gentleman there, and I'm going to ask our panel to come back, and then we, we're going to, we've got time for another round, so <laughs> panic not. Sir. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Paul Gibson, and I work with um, social enterprises, which are businesses for a blend of social and financial return in between philanthropy and what we might call full capitalism. And when we're setting up a social enterprise, we think about ownership in terms of the employees, society, as well as private ownership. And we think about top levels of pay, and we think about median pay. Mm. And we seem, I've been really heartened by the debate tonight, um, we seem to be at one that the relationship between business and society needs to be recalibrated for the benefit not just of society, but I think of business as well, the idea of legitimacy, license to operate, and so forth. But my question really is whether the, the legal status of business, which is the company limited by shares, 
is actually the right model going forward. It stood mm. us in, in good heart over many, many years, and I've grown up with it. But it seems to me it puts too much power in the hands of investors and directors and not enough power in the hands of the workforce, models, community, yeah. society, the environment. Um, and um, I think if we were to re re recalibrate the company limited by shares in a more mutual way, we could actually end up with a society that's better, better for everyone. Great. Um, Xavier, can I, start with, can I start with you? I mean, pick out of that um, banquet what you would what you would like. But I mean, I thought one, one of the, the interesting themes, though, was about assets, whether it is homes, um, whether it is shares in businesses. Um, any reflections on what you've heard? I think greater share ownership is one way of rebalancing it, clearly amongst employees. We're, we're a small company. Uh, we've grown. We've, we've multiplied our capitalization about eight times in the last six years. Mm. Some of your investment managers take a look at us. But employees share in that wealth. <laughs> employees own in that equity. Yeah. The minimum wage in the UK is about £6.50. London wage is £9.15. And we pay the minimum wage, uh, uh, the London wage, for our lowest paid employees, and there's very few of them. Mm. So we're at 9.15 as a starting point. We work in a, contrary to some notion, in a ruthlessly competitive world. Mm. We've had to cut our cost. Our employment has tripled in the last four and a half years. So you can hire, you can operate in a competitive environment. You can share the ownership with employees, give them a share in the reward. And, and, and this can be, there are, there are many schemes out there where you can give any, even give small amounts of equity every month on a voluntary basis. So the tools are there. And I think sharing that, distributing and sharing the wealth so that employees feel that they have a stake is not a new concept. No. It, it can be done. And I think that's the way forward. And there are many companies in the UK doing this. I think what's missing in the sense, and the legitimate, I think, anger and the, the sense of, of, well, this is a lot of talk but no action, mm. is that there are entire segments of the population that actually do not participate in that. There are millions of employees who are share owners in the UK, and they're not the ones complaining, it's the ones who don't. And so how are we gonna create a pool of shareable equity wealth? I go back to my equity themes. Mm -hmm. Of course, some of you will think that the London Stock Exchange and Equity Exchange, I'm basically blowing my own trumpets. It's 6% <laughs> of our revenues, mm. equity trading and insurance, a small, small portion of our revenues. But we need to really leverage the entrepreneurial p potential to create new wealth New enterprise that can be shared right at the beginning with employees. Mm. Because the big companies have a really, really big challenge. Mm. And, and as much as they will do for climate change, for corporate and social responsibility, they are facing absolutely ruthless competition. And it's the only thing that I, I suggest we do not forget. Yeah. Is that route does that 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 competitive dimension doesn't go away yeah. if one legislates or imposes, you know, new burden. So we got to look at new pools of wealth creation that can be shared, shared from the get-go, from the beginning. Yeah. And I think that's achievable. And the UK has 4.8 million SMEs, the biggest pool in Europe. Francis, you're poised to follow that point. I'm just reflecting on the whole issue of sharing assets. So in the 1980s, the right to buy an awful lot of our council homes and the best stock were sold off. Uh, we now have a generation uh, in London, single parents being driven out because the housing benefit is capped, so they have to live in outside of London, um, and then that impacts on how they can work. Uh, we know that we're subsidising low pay to the tune of billions in housing benefits and in work benefits, and we know that the young generation haven't got a chance. Mm at all of ever thinking that they could buy somewhere in London at the same time that uh, in Knightsbridge and Kensington and Chelsea, construction workers are working on constructing swimming pools and cinemas in the basements of those big houses. I mean, it seems to me, what a crazy, crazy situation that we've got into. And Although I think that issue, and it was raised here, you know, that issue of uh, Britain's very particular class system is important and the role that assets play in that, 
I would like us to also think about our collective assets because we've also seen um, many of our most important and cherished public assets sold off, uh, Royal Mail, uh, many of our public services, and often to the detriment of the quality of services in rural areas uh, for the most vulnerable communities. So whilst it's very interesting, I think, to think about assets and individuals, it's also really important to think about our public assets and our public space and the important role that that plays in any society and economy. Very good. Clive, I mean, Resolution Foundation has been at the forefront of thinking about practical steps right. for some time. And now. both of the gentlemen on the front row here asked the same question in uh, admittedly charmingly different ways, which was, so what are you going to do? Yeah. The lever you're going to pull. <laughs> and uh, if I could address that single question of a lever, but also against this backdrop of assets, because yeah. we can't get away from it. No, no, it's there a is great, a group of point, people actually. today, it's yeah, at it's least the 1%, point. who are drawing most of their wealth from assets. And again, that means earning from the, or taking income from the sweat of somebody else's labor. That's the only way to, dis, to describe an income that comes from, from your assets. But that single lever, I believe, we would find common ground on is investment. And that mm -hmm. investment, back to the question from our fund manager, it must have been Emma, I can't remember the name, uh, 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 a question of where countries are sometimes doing a little bit better, is they have more pronounced and longer term investment programs. No one's doing it great. You know, we could yeah, look back on countries over the last uh, 20 years, two, uh, 1992 to 2012, the annualized rate of investment by China uh, was 8.5% every one of those years. But that's a country, as we know, that is its own special miracle. Uh, but it might interest you to know that the next group of countries down included Japan and India. Japan, very large, very industrialized country, both over the same 20 years investing 5% of their annual income in uh, infrastructure and in long-term projects expected to create a base from which their businesses could flourish. The next group down is us in America on exactly half that amount, two and a half percent. Right. So you, you, that's it. Money in equals money out. Yeah. That's, does anyone know any other way to do business? That's it. Now, where's the money coming from for that type mm -hmm. of investment? That's your question. And now we're back to assets. There's really only two ways you can find money for the kinds of multi-billion pound expenditure that we need to commit to over 20 or 30 years in infrastructure, using housing as a way to productively put income uh, 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 capital to, to, to work, and in skills and R&D that then become a common good mm. shared to, uh, to the whole of British business uh, in its widest possible definition, whether it includes social enterprises uh, or, or not. So how are you going to find that money? There's two ways. You borrow it or you tax it. And the great shibboleth is we don't tax assets. They sit there as unproductive. They are unproductive. They are forming a way in which the only thing somebody can actually think to do is limited by their imagination, so they put a swimming pool in their basement, to quote Francis. Really? That's the best you could do? So some kind of what I'd think of as gently prodding tax. You know, in the 1930s, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, in an attempt to stimulate some kind of movement in a moribund United States, pulled all sorts of levers. There's a horrifying list of ones which were terrible, and we never talk about those because we want to remember. <laughs> they were just awful. But one really interesting one was the hoarding tax yeah. on gold. If you're holding it, the economy can't use it. So it's up to you. If you really feel un unsure about the world, keep yeah. your arms around it. Every day you hold it, it's going down in value. That's the hoarding tax. I'd love to see a hoarding tax. Excellent. <laughs> Bob, can, I, can I add a different dimension onto your question about which countries are, are doing some different things? And out of G20, actually, the two that are the most interesting are actually Brazil and Mexico because they were some of the most unequal countries in the world. Mm. And they have actually, over the last few years, significantly reduced their inequality. And they did that because they actually dared to talk about redistribution. Um, which is, you know, wh wh what, you're, what you're sort of saying there, but that's, that is actually how it happened. It was agreed that that had to happen if that country, those countries were going to flourish. Well, I've got the floor. Just a quick one on the, mm, the GDP please. and the environment. Yeah, please, yeah, I'll please. just pick up. Yeah, um, you could not be more right, of course. I mean, we are living beyond the world's um, resources, the resource constraints that we have, particularly in areas like CO2 and the nitrogen cycle and all the rest of it. Um, and, and the problem is, quite rightly, if you keep measuring everything by GDP, we do everything to produce 
reduce GDP and not actually GDP ought to be a measure that is showing that is allowing us to look at how the economy is operating in the service of all the things we want it to do and not the other way around and we're just driving after GDP now how we ever get off this treadmill is quite a difficult one hmm. um, but measures but, are important but measures are important in how they yeah. drive things absolutely and yeah. in a funny way incredibly important as we go into this year with the climate change deal and so on. You, you, I mean, you're absolutely right. You know, we're, we're all talking about this as if the world is in this sort of stable state that we can manipulate things with, and it's absolutely not. I mean, we are, you know, we are looking to a future that, if you don't really take it on, mm. looks pretty ghastly out there. And, and Mike, I mean, please pick whatever you like from that, but if you wouldn't mind picking up some of the productivity questions as well, because I yeah. think that is... I mean, I was just reflecting on a couple of things. I mean, one is <coughs> clearly we need to remember we need to be realistic about where we are as opposed to where we'd like to be. Yeah. We are in a global world that's highly competitive, and we've had these enormous forces and changes that exist. It's absolutely clear to me that investment, innovation, skills, uh, technology, productivity are what we need to be able to encourage. Uh, we have seen societies that have been idealistic and have created much less inequality, for example, Cuba, but without the ability to ever trust themselves to have an election ever again with high levels of actually education, but never transforming into anything. So I kind of look at that and think we've got to be extremely careful about how we move this debate forward. And in answer to your question, I worked for 14 years in continental Europe. And I do think in this country we're too nervous about effective engagement with different stakeholders. And I would name a country who does do it much better. And they got to there 14, 15 years ago when everyone thought they were a basket case with a high cost, high social cost, union involvement, is Germany. And there you see extremely constructive engagement with workers' council. You see very high levels of productivity. You see extremely sensible, agreed deals on productivity versus pay rises against quite a high social cost. Interestingly, and I, I may have this slightly wrong, it's got better German than me, but one of the interesting things about Germany is not being a debt-built society at all. Indeed, now it's being heavily criticized because you know it's out of kilter. But actually, the German word for debt is the same as the German word for reckless. <laughs> and it's, it's an interesting, uh, interesting. aspect of, of the yeah. culture in Germany, uh, who, who we certainly 14, 15 years ago, people in this country were writing off. Can, let me just and they're 24% yeah. more productive today in motor car manufacturing still than we are. And we have to be pay attention. But, but what to is it in the ethos here that makes us anxious about engagement with stakeholders, more intensive I, engagement with stakeholders. I, I, I don't understand it because I think whenever it works and when you, you, you know, I, I, I just think we've not historically, you know, we've had too much conflict between trade unions and whether, you know, I, I'm not, you start getting in very deep areas, whether this is the cataclysm of the Second World War, mm. which was so much more dramatic uh, for mm. continental Europe than mm -hmm. for ourselves mm -hmm. in reality, mm -hmm. how much we suffered in the Blitz. We didn't suffer the way that millions and millions of people went. And I think yeah. that led to a fundamental different uh, approach to engagement between stakeholders uh, in continental Europe. And whilst they've got problems and competitiveness, mainly caused by their politicians, uh, and expend thrift attitude and cheap euro, actually there's been some quite good you know, engagement between stakeholders, uh, particularly in the trade union movement and the business movement, the management, you know, workers' councils, I've seen them. Yes, you can decry supervisory boards, but you know what? You can have some interesting, and I don't support the two-tier board because I think it gets abused in different ways. But I think there's some really interesting things that we ought to be more open to that could make a difference. And I also lastly think profit yeah. sharing, I mean, that's a way to improve productivity in the short term. Mm. I mean, I know you've yeah. looked at this question for some time. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just going to say one of the great ironies of this, of course, is that the German co-determination system was designed by Ernest yes. Bevin when he was yes, foreign absolutely. secretary, yes. he was yes. a former absolutely. trade union leader. So I'm always, again, a little sceptical that there's something inherently in one country's culture that, you know, so could never that. happen here, because there are also plenty of examples uh, which, you know, Mike, the automotive industry, where, you know, of course... And it's true for Germany, too. Of course there are differences. But there's also a sense of a common cause and a sense of a commitment to, um, for example, an active industrial policy, active investment policy, involvement in workers' representatives in longer-term strategic thinking and decision-making. And I don't see why that has to be just confined to a few particular industries in advanced manufacturing. 
um, you know, many of those companies in, who operate the car industry, chemicals, others, in their parent uh, countries run those systems of both single and two-tier boards, where, of course, the majority of European member states now require worker representation on the board. Well, if it works there, why can't it work here? Yeah. Okay. So, but, but just, I, I, think, I think that point about our corporate governance system is really, really important. Mm -hmm. That I do think the shareholder supremacy um, model is under severe strain. It's not delivering. It's encouraging that short-termism that's against <coughs> everybody's interests. And now that we have these big challenges like climate change, mm. where you know the, leaving the market to itself just won't do the job that needs to be done yeah. for the good of us all, and actually many companies recognize the need for certainty, regulation, so that they can make their investment decisions, there are huge opportunities here for us to create that mm. new contract that yeah. Clive was talking about. Right. We're almost out of time. I've got time for about three more. Can I take that gentleman there? Just very quick, please. Yeah. Yes, thank you, uh, Joe Dilger, Educational Governance Consultant. And uh, just picking up on a few points the panel made, uh, Xavier talked about the great just really quick to distrust yeah. about young people entrepreneurs. My question really is to the panel, you are all leaders, yeah. how are you giving young people an opportunity, whether through work experience or yeah. like Barking and Dagenham College did, having the brief yeah. for the new building given out to their students, so the students actually won the bid, won the yeah. tender, designed the new building. Yeah. How are you giving Perfect. people opportunity as leaders? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen there, beard and glasses. Eric Beinhacker, uh, Oxford University, and also working very closely with Clive and the uh, Resolution Foundation. Uh, I wanted to follow on Francis's comments on uh, corporate uh, governance. Um, often in Davos and other places, the tenor of these conversations with business is, well, we'd love to engage with these issues, we'd love to do better, you know, be uh, more ethical, serve society more broadly, but we're shackled uh, by the need to maximize shareholder value in our fiduciary duty. Um, now, questioning this isn't just some you know, lefty liberal idea. <laughs> Warren Buffett, a pretty good investor, called uh, maximizing shareholder value the dumbest idea he'd ever heard of. Um, so do we need a fundamental debate on the purpose of the corporation uh, and how to reconnect uh, corporations, not with just uh, long-term interests of the economy, but long-term interests of society yep. more broadly? Smashing. Right, and I'm going to take one more from there, lady there. And then I'm going to have to stop it there, I'm afraid. Thank you. Thank you. Sally Mugridge, can we just, out of this evening, have one from the team, from the panel, one big, bold statement Lovely. of what we are going to Thank do you. Uh, that we can all buy into? Smashing. Okay. I'm going to ask our panel now to just give us a couple of minutes, um, any sort of final reflections, um, any answers to those questions, and then Archbishop Justin, if you wouldn't mind, I'll just ask you to not try and summarise the <laughs> incredible <laughs> richness that you've heard that you'll be pleased to hear. Um, but any final observations? That would be great. Um, do you want to kick us off, Barbara? Any oh, sort of well, I'm going to be... Final reflections and answers. Well, yeah. final... Re no, sorry, but I do... But, but, and, and actually, the... I mean, you, you, you pose a lovely final question, which is, you know, what's the one big thing? Yeah. What the one big thing is, we better all get out and campaign on climate change this year because it's a one chance in a lifetime. Yeah. yeah. Great. Francis? Um, well, clearly, you know, the TUC's big campaign is for fair shares, fair growth. That's inclusive growth. That's what we want to see. But I think this issue about young people is absolutely critical. Uh, we do, um, we have, I emphasise this, paid internships, that means that people from any background can have a, a chance um, of experiencing work at the TUC. Uh, but I'm also going to be with the National Union of Students and bite the ballot tomorrow uh, to encourage young people to vote. Mm. Yeah. National Voter Registration Day. Yeah. 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 Mike. Yeah. I'd like to see a cross-party 20-year blueprint of what we're going to do for skills and education and stick to it. Yeah. Brilliant. I'd like Mike to get his wish. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like, furthermore, for that to include a 3% of GDP, so 50 billion a year, 20-year commitment to spend on infrastructure, skills, and other productive investments, and control of that 50 billion a year to be handed outside of Parliament to yeah. a commission on infrastructure spending. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And finally, Xavier. 
I'll give you two for the price of one. Hey. You're a good man. Double teacher's salaries with the appropriate selection. Are there any teachers here? You can vote for Xavier at the end. Yeah. <laughs> he gets the lot. And secondly, create a five million apprentice program over 10 years, not funded by government, because government doesn't really know fundamentally where the needs are, they may have an idea. Uh, and not focus on university education as much. Germany, only 20% of the population, the working population goes to university, but they have a huge apprentice program, trained by firms. You can be a very senior member of management with no university education, a successful apprentice program, and that creates a, a, a relationship, a, a binding, a bond effectively between the employees and the, and the companies. Uh, so with, without an apprentice program, that participative sort of management style doesn't work. Those are the two things I would do. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Archbishop Justin, do you want to offer any final thoughts? And one question, I suppose, is a, is, is, is a, is a sort of genuine question from a, from a politician, which is when you have heard what you've heard tonight and when you think about how this debate should and could unfold over the next four or five years, what would you like to see good people who care about this debate doing? <clears throat> Final ideas, and then I try and answer that question. It seems to me that underlying what we were talking about was sustainability. That picked up the question in the, in fact, in the General Synod debate, I referred to the word sustainability was aimed at issues of climate change but I thought I was going to overrun my time anyway, so I cut a sentence. Um, I think there's an awful lot in what people have been saying is essentially about the long term. Mm. And the challenge is how, in a five-year electoral cycle, with five-minute reactions on Twitter yeah. and um, uh, not much better in other forms of public discourse, <laughs> how do we get uh, a long-term view? And how do we actually say, that? because the, the doubling the 2.5%, that is a massive transfer. It has to be, so it won't benefit this generation, it benefits the next one. Mm. And I have the benefit of not being elected, which is, I'll come back to in a minute. So I think that the, the big issue is around education skills, long term, that's been underlying the things we've been saying, is looking at the long term, and that's where you touch on young people, because you're designing uh, a good economy, a society, which will benefit them in the long term. And the challenge is, how do we do that? Is it a cross-party thing? Is it something that, like, for instance, um, certain values we have in society around the NHS is something that everyone accepts is a given and that nobody challenges because we all accept it's the right thing to do? Mm. That, that seems to me the big challenge and underlying issue. Mm -hmm. um, what was your question? <laughs> what do we, what do the good people do next to what do the good move people this do debate next? on? And I think engage, I mean, there's been a number of questions this evening about where's the practical steps, where's the action? What do good people do next to try and I move the well, debate on, but actually begin grinding out in, some of the In things. practical action, it, it just reminds me of the aim We've got my own, um, I don't call it an organization. Nobody knows the church finger, we call it that. Um, <laughs> institution. Um, uh, is the employment of uh, apprentices, is mm. the devel development of apprenticeships. We have 9,000 listed buildings, which we spend huge nine-figure sums on in maintenance and development. Mm. Um, Canterbury Cathedral alone has 350 full-time staff of whom uh, five are clergy. Um, and uh, they take on apprentices at a rate of knots. Let's widen that out. That's one thing we can do in the Church of England. Yeah. We can also do something, uh, we can continue to reform and, and look afresh. And I saw Andrew Adonis come in earlier, uh, and I've been hugely influenced by his book on education. We can look afresh at how we train and develop the almost one million young people who we educate in church school. Mm. So there's some practical stuff and for us. It, and it, and it and feels like there, is, there, there, are, there are agenda items here where it should be possible to begin generating that long-term consensus now. I think it's what good people do next. One is look for ways of 
in their own areas look for ways of taking on young people of training and mm. developing, and secondly, look for ways of developing this long-term consensus. That's what good people yeah. do. And there's a final step, which is obviously absolutely essential, is to ban all the old Etonians from senior positions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you've enjoyed this evening. I, I think it's been an extraordinary debate. And um, in, in sort of preparation for tonight, one of the things that I read was a remarkable essay written in 1935, and it was J.M. Keynes's uh, Economic Prospects for Our Grandchildren. There's an extraordinary sentence in that essay, which is about um, the economic pessimism of the revolutionaries and the economic pessimism of the reactionaries. And what Keynes says is that the, revolution, the, the reactionaries will tell you that no change is possible, and you might as well just give up hope. And the revolutionaries will tell you that the system is uh, bankrupt and it just needs smashing to pieces. And when you look across the political world today, you don't have to look too far before you see new reactionaries and new revolutionaries. Happily, they're a lot tamer than the rise of the fascists and Oswald Mosley in the 1930s. Um, and, you know, the Communist Party of Great Britain is not the force that it once was. But there is a real struggle, and I hope you've seen it tonight, uh, amongst good people in the middle, between the reactionaries and the revolutionaries, to try and define this new social contract that Clive talked about. In the all-party group, we hope to be one of the four in which uh, those practicalities get developed, where we find those points of consensus and deepen them, both in the short term and in the long term. And I hope you'll stay engaged in the debates that we try and have as we try and bring good people like the people on this panel together. Thanks very much indeed for joining us this evening, and please stay in touch. Thank you.